Beloved, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? Yeah. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Now you are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what you shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I want to use a subject this morning. I'm marked for greatness. That's what the Lord spoke to me, that, that I'm marked for greatness. That for somebody in here, God has earmarked you, set you aside, set you up as it were. And the reason why the enemy can't have you is because you've already been marked for greatness. Can you say amen? Father, bless your word on today. I step out of the way and ask that you would step up. Do what you do. Holy Ghost, throw your weight around in this place. Give us the divine ability to minister your word and give the kind of anointing that makes preaching easy. <laughs> Break yokes today. Change lives today. Argue with us today. Convince us today that we are marked by the master for greatness. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I want to talk for just a minute about first impressions because there was a study done by uh, some Princeton psychologists that found that it takes mere seconds, only about a tenth of a second, to form an opinion or form that all-important first impression of somebody. In other words, when we meet somebody for the first time, our brains take in information about them. We, we size them up, as it were. We're, we, we're. Our brain is constantly taking in information. You first meet them. We're, we're sizing up things like how tall they are, how short they are, what, what skin color they are. We, we've sized up everything about it. In the first few minutes, some suggest that it takes about 30 seconds, it takes a millisecond of a moment for people to form opinions about people. And here's what I want you to understand, that in those first few moments, we determine how we're going to interact with that person going forward. Yeah, in the first few seconds that I've met you, my brain has already processed who you are. It's, it's an animal instinct. It's what makes animals survive in the wild. They have to determine very quickly, is this a friend or a foe? Is this somebody I should get away from or somebody I should be drawn to? And those determinations are made within the first few seconds that you meet somebody, and sometimes, but here's the problem, sometimes you're so married to that initial impression that we find it very difficult to change our opinion about somebody, even when presented with new evidence that points to the contrary. Ever done that? Ever met somebody on first meeting and you decided, I don't like them? And then when you found out or spent some time with them, you found out they were cool as a fan. They was all right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we made pop decisions, prejudgments about people. In the first few seconds, we decided we're not. Or have you ever done this? Maybe you've done this, Carmen. Maybe you met somebody and you thought they was cool upon first meeting. And then after you got to know them, you realized that your initial impression of them was completely wrong. And this is somebody crazy that you need to get away from as quick as you can. <laughs> Anybody ever done that? But sometimes what we do is when we meet people in those first few seconds, we're so married to that first imprint, that first impression that it's hard for us to even break away from it. So once I'm convinced I like you, you could almost be a criminal. You could be an outlaw, but I'm still convinced that you're a good person. <laughs> and once I'm convinced that I don't like you, a bomb can go off and I still will be convinced that I don't like you for whatever reason. That's because as human beings, we seem to be pre-wired for prejudgment. That's really what prejudice is. It means to judge something beforehand. You don't even have all the facts. You don't even have all the information. You just met me, and you've already decided that I'm not somebody that you want to be bothered with. Because here's what it is. First impressions are mental shortcuts that we take to shorten the process that's necessary to build lasting relationships. 
We don't take the time, we don't take the effort, we don't put the energy into getting to know people, and so we have these first impressions that shortcut the process of building real relationships and get right to it, and then we decide whether you will or whether you won't be involved with that person. But you gotta be careful. Here's where you gotta be careful. Because first impressions, though they are powerful, they are not always true, and they're not always accurate. In fact, when you meet somebody for the first time, the way you deal with them in those first few encounters says more about you than it says about them. Truth be told, when I make prejudgments about you, it says more about who I am, about how I am more so than who they are, because get this, our impressions are actually rooted in our own experiences. Yeah, my impression of Michael is rooted in my own experiences. My impression of Carmen is rooted in my own experiences. And so when you meet people or you meet different situations, the first thing we say is things like, you remind me of. Yeah, you remind me of my ex-boyfriend. You remind me of my last boss. You remind me of my last girlfriend. You remind me of my last uh, 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 pastor. And so we make these snap judgments, snap, snap decisions about people without delving further into who they are and what they are. And they're really rooted in who we are, the things that we've experienced. And get this, some of the things we've experienced have been bad experiences. Some of them have been good experiences. And we tend to judge new people based on where you've been and what you've experienced. Are you following me so far? Can I take my time and unpack this just a little bit? There's a term in psychology known as imprinting. Write that down. And imprinting is a phenomenon in which new, newborn creatures bond to the type of animal they meet at birth. You might know it as the baby duck syndrome because it's believed that baby ducks and geese, they are imprinted on the first moving animal that they see when they're born that the moment they come out of the egg, they're hatched, that whatever's in front of them when they open up their eyes, that's the thing that they bond to. Oh, are you with me so far? They grow such a sense of comfort, familiarity, and normalcy with those first encounters that they basically follow them all around the yard. Have you ever seen them on those movies where uh, the, the, the duck opens his eyes and there's a cat standing in front of them or a dog standing in front of them or a horse standing in front of them? It, it, it's, it's so powerful that even if it's an inanimate object like a pair of shoes, they'll attach to those shoes. And wherever those shoes go, the duck follow you around. If it's a cat, even though the cat is not your mama and y'all don't share the same character, you follow that thing around because that's the first impression that you have. They grow such a sense of comfort, familiarity, and normalcy that they'll even try to imitate the behavior of the thing that has first been presented to them. I'm going to go deep here because this happens not only naturally for human beings, it happens spiritually. That sometimes the thing that you are exposed to as a new Christian becomes the standard by which you measure other experiences that you may have. And so if you were brought up in a certain kind of church, a Baptist church, a Pentecostal church, a Methodist church, and that's your first experience with church life when you became a Christian, that becomes your standard by which you measure other ministries that you may encounter. If your first experience maybe of giving your life to Christ was through a certain teaching style or a preaching style, that style becomes your standard by which you measure everybody else that you come into. Here's the idea. The idea is that many of the preferences, the proclivities, and the leanings that we have and the attraction to certain things can be traced back to, get this, early exposure during your formative years. During your most impressionable years as a child. During the most impressionable years as a new Christian that you begin to form those opinions. So much so that even when you're presented with other options, with better choices, we still tend to have a pull toward the familiar. Have you ever noticed that? That you can bring in teachers, you can bring in trainers, Sharita, you can bring in people that will teach you about going to the next level. Maybe, maybe on your job or maybe even in church, we can bring people in that will help us to get better at what we do and we're fine as long as they're standing in front of us. But as soon as they leave, we revert back to the familiar. It's human nature. 
And so while you're here and while you're teaching, it's a great time, it's wonderful. I've sat in a training class at work, and while they were presenting the information, it was great, it was wonderful. I took notes, we high five, we did all that. But as soon as the instructor was taken away, I revert back to what is familiar. I revert back to who I was before. And so all over the ministry and all over the church, you will see people reverting back to their formative years, to their first encounters, to their first impressions of what God is and what God isn't. In other industries, it's known as casting. Yeah, it's called casting. For example, in the steel industry, they have what they call metal casting. And metal casting is a process where they pour uh, molten steel or molten metal into a custom-made mold. And when they put the metal into the mold and it cools, it takes on the shape of the thing that it's been poured into. And they call it casting. And once that shape is set, it is set in that place for the life of the object. So, for example, I may take steel and I may imprint it or cast it in the shape of a barrel. Yeah, or in the shape of a pole, or in the shape of a bumper. And whatever that mold is, that cast in, they are doomed to stay in that shape for the rest of its life. It is doomed to stay in the shape of the thing that it has been cast in. And so try as they might, I've been shaped in the form of a bumper, and that's what I am, and that's what I'll always be because I've been cast. Yeah. In the film industry, they call it typecasting. And that's where you see certain actors. You know this. There are certain actors that you see play certain roles, and they play that same role in every movie. You ever seen that happen? Like, you're a gangster, right? You're a gangster in this movie, and that's my first impression. And you played that role so good that every time they want a gangster in a the movie, they call you. And your favorite actor, though it's a different movie, different style, different actresses, different scenes and everything, you always play the villain. <laughs> or you always play the prostitute. Or you always play the businessman. And what hap what's happening is you, you're being cast according to people's impressions of you. Yeah, you're being cast according to people's view of you. And some of you are victims of that right now. That certain people have formed an opinion about you, a thought, an idea about you. And every time they think of certain things, they think of you because they think you are one-dimensional. That's your one thing. And they don't even give you the benefit of personal growth. That though you met me then, that's not who I am now. That though you might have met me in a certain place in my life, please do not believe that that is not what that was then and this is now. But when people typecast you in their mind and they've decided that you'll never be anything, that you'll never do anything, that you'll never get up, that you'll always be an alcoholic, that you'll always be a drug dealer, that you'll always be a liar, that you'll always be a thief, that they begin to deal with you based on their perception. There it is. Their perception of you. And here's what's so dangerous about that, that sometimes their projection becomes your reality. That sometimes it's not who, who I am, it's who you think I am that makes me behave the way I do. So because you expect that from me, that's what you get from me. You expect me to be a hothead, and so that's what you get from me. And so my, my, my behavior is sometimes shaped by the opinion of other people. Have you ever experienced it? Where people begin to shape and mold your behavior. I wouldn't normally act like this on my own, but when I get around certain people, that my behavior becomes modified to fit what they are wanting me to do, and so I've been cast. Somebody shout cast. Oh, let me unpack this some more. This casting is so powerful, it can affect even how you serve God. Because when faced with the choice of having dead religion versus real relationship with God, amazingly, some people choose to have dead religion, dead tradition, things that don't even work, things that have no power because they're used to it. Yeah, I, 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 at least I know what this, I know it has no power, I know it doesn't change my life, I know it does not affect me in any positive way, but I'm used to it. Some of you know what I'm saying because you do the same thing when it comes to the relationship that you choose. Oh, my God, I'm going to leave it alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Here's what, I want you to write this down. Custom often blinds judgment and it blinds conscience. 
When you are somebody who is so married to your tradition, your denomination, your way of doing things, it often blinds you, it blinds your judgment, and it blinds your conscience, and you do things that are contrary even to what you believe on the core because your judgment has been skewed by your marriage to your denominational belief. And people who become accustomed to a certain atmosphere are always unaware of how foul that atmosphere can be. Have you ever noticed that? Anybody know about that Febreze commercial where people become nose blind? That in your house, in your car, in your living room, it smells fine to you because you live there all the time. It's normal to you. But somebody who's never been there can walk into it and immediately notice things wrong because the things that you've gotten used to, they already see a problem with it. And is it true, it could it be true in church that some of us have just become nose blind? That even though it's crippled and crazy and doesn't work and has no power and has no impact because I'm used to it, because I'm used to the sound, I'm used to how Sister Mary is, I'm used to how the drummers drum, I'm used to how certain people sing, even though it may not be effective, it may not be powerful, at least I'm used to it. And some people in the face of new information and a new opportunity, they still revert back to what they're used to. It, it smells awful, but I'm used to it. And oh, I want to talk to somebody in here who has gotten spiritually nose blind. That the stuff that used to repel Christians and wouldn't be named among us has become so familiar to you that you don't even have an issue with it. You can do anything. You can live any kind of way. You can say any kind of way. And you feel no conviction because you become spiritually nose blind. And somebody else can come from the outside and immediately detect that there's a foul odor in here. Something just don't smell right. But to you, you say, I'm fine. I'm good. Let me give you some scripture. Jesus said this. He said, if a man, listen, 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 I'm going to go here. Jesus said this, no man having drunk old wine right away desires the new wine. Because here's what he says, the new wine, the old wine is better. You ever notice that, Connie? He said, when you present new information to people who are steeped in tradition, that they, re they, don't, they don't accept it right away, Sharita. They reject it. They repel it because they say that the old wine is better. I'm good. That's what they say. And some people, they never even entertain the idea that what they have, there may be something better for you. You never even entertain the idea that there may be something higher for you. You never entertain the idea that God may have something greater for you. Therefore, you stay stuck, stuck in religion, stuck in relationships, stuck in jobs, stuck in careers, stuck in situations, stuck in churches and cities and mindsets and attitudes and stuck in behaviors that have become habitual because you believe there's nothing better coming. That's why you keep picking the same kind of people every time. Different name, same person. Different city, same person. Their name is not Fred anymore. Their name is Bobby, but they still act the same way. You just got a different name. Uh, but I come to tell somebody that there is something greater. That though the enemy is trying to convince you that good is good enough, God is saying that there's something greater. That you don't have to be stuck. That you don't have to be cast. That you don't have to be stuck in a mold. That you don't have to accept being doomed to be who you are. And I hear in my head the sound of somebody who is pulling against their old nature. Pulling against things they've been involved in. Saying, I'll never go back to alcohol. I'll never go back to a certain kind of person. I'll never go back to that certain behavior. But even though you try to pull away, something keeps pulling you back. But I come to tell somebody that Jesus is a habit breaker. Where are my witnesses at? That Jesus is a habit breaker. You can have an addiction. You can have a problem. You can have an issue that's been following you all your life. But the God we serve is able to break that mold. I wish I had a church up in here. Somebody say break it. You can't get new results from having old patterns. You can't get new results from doing the same old thing. 
Something has to occur in our lives that breaks the mold, that breaks the cast, that changes the imprinting, that changes the script, that changes the pattern, that rewrites the program and gives me a fresh start. God has marked me for something greater and Jesus is going to break it. Look at somebody and say, God's going to break it. God's going to break it. God's going to break. You might be somebody say, I don't do church like that. I don't shout where I come from. I don't lift my hands where I come from. I don't do what y'all do. Y'all got too much emotion going on. You're too loud. It's too long. It's too much. But I'm trying to tell you that God is trying to introduce you to another level of relationship, to a whole other level of glory. If you lift your hands right here, God said, I'll put the glory on you. Lift your hands right here and say, God, show me your glory. I'm tired of church as usual. I'm tired of coming here and sing a song and go home. I'm tired of coming in as a wet devil and leave as a dry devil. I'm tired of coming in having the same old, same old. I did not get up this morning and get dressed and drive across town to have the same old experience that I had last Sunday and the Sunday before that. Is there anybody in here who came to have an encounter with God? Throw your hands up in the air and shout, I came to see Jesus. I came to have an encounter with God. So, in our text, 1 John is one of the most intimate New Testament writings in the New Testament. Because it reads like a family letter. Uh, it reads like a letter from a father to his spiritual children. Are you with me so far? Who are in the world. So Some suggest this. This is Father's Day. And some suggest that fathers are not necessary and that they're not important. Yeah. Somebody called me the other day and said, Pastor, I don't understand what it is. Uh, Mother's Day, it was like Christmas time out here. Everything was on sale. Traffic was everywhere. You know, parties were going on. Couldn't get in restaurants. But it, it's not the same reaction when it comes to fathers. And that's because our society does a really good job of trying to convince us that fathers are not necessary, that they're not even important. But research has suggested that the presence or the absence of a father has a profound effect on the development of a child, boy or girl. A father can affect how they view themselves. A father affects how they view the world. A father helps shape how they see themselves in the world. A father shapes how a young man is supposed to view the world and who he's supposed to be and how he fits in. It shapes who the daughter thinks she is. It begins to put them on a path as to what kind of people she should date and who she should marry. Fathers are significant. Somebody say fathers are significant. I come to tell a father in here that you are significant. I don't care what the, de what the world's been telling you. I don't care what the devil's been telling you. You are important. Though they tell you that you don't matter, though they tell you you have no real contribution, though they say that you are not important in their lives, and even if you have an estranged child who says you've never done nothing for me and that you never meant nothing to me, I come to tell you by the Holy Ghost that you matter. You are significant. You are important. Somebody help me celebrate the men of God in this house, the fathers, the good fathers, the bad fathers, the stepfathers, the spiritual fathers, the step. Yeah. So in 1 John, it writes like a father is writing to his spiritual sons and he's telling them the truth about who they are in Christ. Because that's what I need from a father. I need a truth teller. Everybody needs somebody that they respect enough that will stand up and tell you the truth. And many people's lives are affected today because you can't handle the truth. And anybody that tries to tell you the truth, you quickly dismiss them, block them, shut them down, shut them off. But there may be some truth to what they're saying. If you've had the last five jobs and all five jobs keep saying the same thing, it may not be them, Carmen, it may be you. If you've been to the last five churches and every church is having the same issue with you, it may not be the churches you attend, it may be you. Are you open to the fact that maybe the things that I'm experiencing in my life have nothing to do with the people I've encountered, but it may have everything to do with the choices I've made? Ain't no men no good. It ain't that all men ain't no good. It's just the men you chose. I ain't going to get no amens. 
You're going to write off all men because you had a bad experience with somebody. You chose that joker. You took him home. You threw away all of your... Don't blame it. Don't paint a broad stroke and say all women are bad. It's the women you chose. You could have chosen not to, and you could have chosen to, and you chose. Oh. Yeah. Can I get a good amen in here without saying? So here is the apostle saying, I'm going to lay down the truth. <laughs> you might get mad and walk out, but at least you're going to hear the truth. Because the Bible said that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. For somebody, if you just had somebody who had enough nerve to stand up to you and tell you the truth, your whole life could be different from now. But every time they try to tell you something you don't want to hear, you shut them down, you walk off, you walk out, you call them crazy, you start rebuking them in the name of Jesus, you act like everybody's something wrong with them. But God said today, I'm going to expose you to the truth. Somebody shout, Lord, tell me the truth. Tell me the truth if it hurts my feelings. Tell me the truth if I'm going to be mad at you. Tell me the truth if I have to stop speaking for three weeks and I have to come back and say, you know what, sis, you was right. But for God's sake, don't tickle my ear. Don't play with me. Don't let me be going down the wrong path and you know I'm going down and you don't say nothing to me. How dare you call yourself a friend if you know I'm going down the wrong path and you don't say nothing. Common. I don't trust people who say, I'm going to just let them go on. I ain't going to say nothing. I'm going to let them go. I know this is not going to work. I know it's going to fail. I know it's going to fall apart, but I ain't going to say nothing. If you got people in your life like that, you need to reevaluate who you have in your circle. Because a friend loves at all times. They will tell you something even if you don't want to hear it. Sometimes God will send you real friends and start getting rid of some of these fake friends who are leading you to destruction. Oh. So here, here's some truths that he sets down. Write this down. Truth number one. He tells them the truth about who they are. Yeah. He said, now are you the sons of God. That's a definitive statement, Michael. The new life in Christ is a fact. It's not a feeling. And the reason many people don't enjoy their walk with God is because you base everything you do on a feeling. The new life in Christ is a fact. Now you are the sons of God. I may not feel like it all the time, creator. I may not act like it all the time. But it is a fact. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. The Christian walk is a daily process of taking off and putting on. Of taking off old stuff and putting on new stuff. And here's what I want you to get, Catherine. God has declared over you that you are my child. You may be a weak child. You may be a struggling child. You are my child. And the Christian walk is a process of taking off who you used to be to adopt who you're going to be. And what I love about God is my life consists of me becoming what he's already told me I am. Did you catch that? God has already told you what you are. That's a fact. And now I have the job of making my life come up to what he's already spoken. That's why he said, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. I may not feel rich. I may not look rich, but I am rich. And in a matter of time, it's just a matter of time before my bank account catches up to my reality. Y'all don't hear me. Y'all don't hear me. When God speaks a word of prophecy over your life, your, may, your life may not look like it at first. In fact, sometimes, Catherine, it looks like it's going in the other direction. But I dare to stand there and declare the word of the Lord and agree with God and say, I am. I am blessed. I am healed. I am delivered. I am set free. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not believe. Look at somebody and say, you don't know me. I am a child of God. The enemy wants to convince you because you've been weak or because you failed or because you made mistakes that you're not a child of God. But I rebuke that spirit and let you know that you are a child of God and I'm becoming. 
That's why some people have issues with me, because I'm becoming. I, I had this very heated conversation uh, with a very dear friend of mine, and we were having this long conversation, about an hour or so, and they kept referring to me like the person I used to be. And I took it, Mark, for about 40 minutes. Then I finally said, wait, 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 wait. I looked him in the eye and said, you don't know me, do you? Of course I know you. I've known you for 20 years. No, you don't know me, because you're still referring to me like the person I used to be. And I'm not saying I wasn't that person, Catherine. I'm not saying I didn't do those things, but you haven't been around me long enough to see the transformation. How many of you are glad that you're not who you're going to be, but you're not who you used to be? Where are my witnesses at? Yeah. Yeah. The Christian rock is a process. I'm blessed. I'm favored. I'm free. Talk about Juneteenth. We just celebrated Juneteenth on yesterday, which is the fact that we're celebrating the fact that the slaves were free for about two years before they found out in Texas that they were actually free. So that means for two years, brother, for two years, they were still acting like a slave, living like a slave, working like a slave, being mistreated like a slave until somebody finally came and let them know that you are free. I come to tell somebody in here that you are free. You're not excited about that. You, you're waiting for a feeling to be free. I got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. But is there anybody in here without any feeling, without any drums, without anybody pumping you that can know for a fact that I'm free, I'm blessed, I'm healed? Jump on your feet and declare, I'm free. That devil is a liar. I'm a blessed woman of God. My womb is blessed. My children are blessed. I came up in a crazy house, but I'm a blessed man of God. Slap somebody say, I'm a blessed man of God. I'm a blessed woman of God. Number two, second truth. You have to accept the truth about what you have. And what I mean by this is that the best part of you, I suspect, has not even been revealed yet. That people haven't seen the best of you. You haven't sung your best song. You haven't preached your best message. You haven't done your best work. You haven't been who you're going to be. The enemy has convinced you that you've gone as high as you can go, but I come to tell somebody that the best has not been seen yet. You haven't written your best book yet. I don't care what song you sung, what project you created. God said to tell you, you haven't seen the best of you yet. All you're getting right now is previews, commercials of what you shall be. Because somebody has convinced you that where you are is where you're going to always be. That what you have is what you're always going to have. And there you are stuck in a place because you believe the lie that the enemy has told you that you have topped out, that you have capped out, that you're always going to be a drug dealer, that you're always going to be a liar, that you're always going to be who you were. But I come to call that devil a liar. The story is told to me of a, a young eagle who was raised by a family of chickens. And uh, he thought that he was a chicken because he was around chickens. And so you know how chickens are. They, they tend to have their feet, their, their beak stuck in the ground, pecking. They can only see a few feet in front of them. They spend their whole existence clucking around the yard, scratching, pecking. And so because this young eagle thought he was a chicken, he hung around chickens. He tried to do what the chickens do. Even though he was physically built differently from the people around him, he acted like they did because he thought he was a chicken. So when they scratched in the dirt, he scratched in the dirt. My beak is different. My feet are different. But I've accepted the fact that I'm a chicken. And I come to tell somebody, you're hanging around some chicken folk. You're never going to go any higher than the company you keep. And the reason why you can't do more with your life is because you surrounded yourself with people that don't want anything. They don't want anything. They're not going anywhere. And when you try to get out of group thing, they make you think something's wrong with you because you want something different. And every time a little eagle try to do something different, the other chicken will push on him and say, now you know you're a chicken. Some of y'all got friends right now who every time you get a good idea, they shoot it down. 
Every time you got a project, they're going to tell you what's wrong with it. Every time you say, I'm going to live better, I'm going to be better, I'm going to do better, they convince you, why would you be different? Come on and be a chicken like the rest of us. Cluck, 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 cluck. And all that was fine, Jonathan, until one day the young eagle looked up in the sky and he saw an eagle soaring through the air. And when he saw that eagle cutting the air, an eagle being the most powerful uh, a creature that's flying through the air, he said, oh my God, that's me. Some of you, God said, I'm just trying to raise your mentality. You're too low. You're way too high to think that low. And the problem is you're hanging around these chicken folk. Michael, I can't be around chicken folk. I can't be around chicken mentality. I can't get around people who every time it's time to do something, you get scared. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, we can't go there. Oh, we tried that the last time. You hang around some chicken folk. If you got people that God speaks to you powerfully and you get energized and you get motivated and you get around certain people and it deflates your balloon, that's a chicken. If you get around people who always try to convince you that your life is all right the way it is, that's a chicken. Get away from the chicken folk. You got to get away from some people who challenge you on another level, who challenge you to think higher, who challenge you to go deeper. Because until you get around somebody who will stand in your face and put their finger in your chest and tell you you're better than that, you'll always be a chicken. Stop dismissing everybody that gets on your nerves. Some of them are there to push you to be greater than you ever thought that you could be. Oh my God, I need somebody to push me. Push on somebody and say, push me. Don't hold me back. Don't hold me down. Push me. I want to be a better singer. I want to be a better musician. This is not good enough for me. I want to be a better preacher. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. This is not good enough for me. Push on somebody and say, it's better than that. I looked up. Oh, Pastor Jonathan, I was fine hanging with the chickens until I looked up and saw somebody that looked like me. Because here's the problem. No matter how much you try, you can't change, a, change the nature of a chicken to an eagle. It's not where the eagle became somebody different. He was always an eagle. He just didn't know it. I come to talk to some eagles in here. I'm not giving you something that you don't always have. It's always been in you. It's always been there. I'm just calling out of you what was already there. You can't change somebody who is destined to be a chicken into an eagle. Those are two different creatures. Some people are destined to be chickens. That's all they are. That's all they want to be. That's all they're ever going to be. But somebody in here, I don't know who I'm talking to, for somebody in here, you sense that there's something different about you. You sensed it since you've been a child. You sensed it since you've been a little girl. You see things differently. You process things differently. Things that other people see as funny, you don't. And everybody laughing, having a good time and kicking back. But you're thinking, this is stupid. This is stupid as I don't know what. I don't even know why you're laughing at that. Because you see things, you process things differently. You see things down the road. An eagle can see things from miles away. It's called vision. I can see small objects from miles away. Chickens can only see a few feet in front of them. That's why when you have conversations with certain people, they get bored and they can't hang because they're talking about what we're going to do after church. And I'm talking about what I'm going to do in the next five years. God is talking to me about my next steps, about where he's taking me. And you want to talk about what they're talking about on Real House, of Atlanta, Real House Lives of Atlanta. Somebody in here, God, while I'm speaking, is giving you a vision for what he's going to do for you in the next five, ten years. And somebody else is only thinking about where we're going to eat after church. Push on somebody say, get around some eagles. Get around some eagles. Get around some folk that are sore. Get around somebody that says, I, I believe I can fly. 
I, I may not have my wings exercised yet. My wings may be weak. I may not have the business plan together yet. I may not have all the support I need yet. I may not know exactly what I'm doing yet, Catherine, but I believe. See, that's my problem. I believe I can fly. And sometimes people laugh at me and they call me crazy, Angela, but I believe. Is there anybody in here that believe it? I'm not asking you, do you have the job yet? I'm not asking you if you have the marriage yet. I'm not asking you if you have the business yet. I just want to ask you, do you believe it? If you believe it, shout at your boy and say, I believe it. That's the truth. Last thing and I'm done. You have to accept the truth about who you shall be. That when he shall appear, we shall see him as he is. I'm going to suddenly understand who I am. The way to live your life in a way that pleases God is to model your life after Jesus himself. When it comes to people, we can admire people. We can respect people. We can glean from people. We can even get tips from people. Best practice is what businesses do. They go to other businesses and they see things that other people are doing that are working and they may imitate that, right? They, they adopt what they call best practices. You can get tips from other people, but, but let me warn you about this. You should never completely model your life after any one person, ever. Because no matter how accomplished they are, successful they are, how much they have, what they drive, anybody you model your life after in this world is flawed material at best. It's flawed. It's flawed. And when you try to imitate their behavior, you also adopt their flaws. Nobody, not your pastor, not your deacon, not your mother, not your spiritual mother, everybody's got flaws. So what we need to do is to model our lives after Jesus. I know that's hard. We can't only take it in church right now because everybody's trying to find a role model. And I'm going to wear my hair like Lady Tanya wears her hair. And I'm going to wear my shoes like Catherine wears her shoes. And I'm going to sing like Jonathan. And I'm going to preach like my. And you want to be like all these people. Ain't nothing wrong with following people. Nothing wrong with that. Even Paul said in one place, Mike, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. So there's nothing wrong with imitating people, but you can't let them be the absolute, the absolute model because Jesus is the one you're supposed to be modeling your life after. Models matter. Anything else and anybody else you're modeling after is not going to please God because all those models are flawed at best. The Bible says this, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of my faith. That's what I'm supposed to be looking at. That the Bible says that the more we look at him, we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. That you become the thing that you're staring at. You ever notice that? That when you notice certain people, you admire them, you start taking on little traits, little attributes, maybe the way they dress or the way they speak or the way they walk or the way they talk. And many people who will spend hours studying other people won't spend five minutes studying Jesus. And you wonder why you don't take on his character and his behavior. But the more I look at Jesus and stare at him, the more I become transformed. See, right now, you and I are both in a transformation process. Don't let nobody criticize you because you're not perfect yet, because they're not either. But I'm being transformed. That the longer I look at him, the longer I stare at him, the longer I pay attention to him, I'm in a transformation process. How many people know I'm in the process? Where are my real Christians at? I'm, I'm, I'm transforming right now. I'm better than I used to be. I pray differently. I praise God differently. I go deeper than I used to. The things that used to throw me don't throw me like they used to. The things that used to get on my nerves don't throw me like they used to. The things that used to make me cry don't make me cry like they used to because I'm changing. Look at somebody say, I'm changing. I'm changing right before your eyes. I'm changing while you're looking. While you're talking about me, I'm changing. That's why you can't pay no attention to your critics. Because while you're talking, you're talking to my back. Because <laughs> I'm changing. Let me close with this. Uh, I have one of those smart TVs in my house, and, uh, and they're really smart. But one of the things that gets on my nerves about them is that they always pop up with this message that says, uh, 
a new software is available. <laughs> Do you want to update? Yeah, it pops up. It doesn't force it on me. It just asks me, do you want to update? And uh, Catherine, I'll be honest with you, most times I say no. You know why? Because I'm impatient, I'm busy, I want to get right to it, I want to get on with the show, so I push no. I don't want to take the time to push yes, because if I push yes, I know it's going to start a process that's going to take time. So I'm in a hurry. So I say, no, I ain't got time for no updates. I ain't got time to go to school. I ain't got time to go to class. I ain't got time to learn nothing new. I'm busy doing what I'm supposed to do. But what you don't know is every time you say no, you're missing an opportunity for your TV or your phone or your computer to download information that you're going to need later. That the updates are not there just to get on your nerves. It's to add to your. It's to add to your situation. It's to add to your equipment. And it's the same thing is true with Christ. Some of you, you haven't done anything new since you got saved in 1972. You're still doing the same two-step that you've been doing. You still got the same raggedy praise. You're still doing the same thing you did 15 years ago and wonder why you haven't experienced anything greater. You need an update. <laughs> God has called somebody here to say that you need an update. When you see him, you shall see him as he is, not as he was. As he is, not as he was. This is not the Jesus who walked the shores of Galilee. This is not the Jesus that was dragged through the streets of Jerusalem and beaten like a dog and hung on a cross. This was not the Jesus that was hanging between two thieves. This is the resurrected Jesus. This is the victorious Jesus. This is the Jesus who sits on the right hand of the Father. This is the Jesus that said, all things are under my feet. This is the Jesus that said, all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. You need an update. If you still walking around here talking about the Jesus that was dragged through Jerusalem, baby, you need an update. You need a victorious Jesus, a powerful Jesus, a glo Lift your hands and say, I need a glorious Jesus. I need a glory. That's why my praise can't be dry. That's why I can't hardly stand it. If you drag me into a dry praise, I just want to get my bags and get out. Because when I think about where I met Jesus and how crazy I was and what I was into and what I was dealing with, and now I found a powerful Jesus. Somebody lift your hands if you know you got a powerful Jesus. Yeah, I got a Jesus that'll put his foot on his enemy's neck. And because that's who he is, that's who I am. Somebody step your foot and say, I put my foot on it. I'm putting my foot on poverty. I'm putting my foot on depression. I'm putting my foot on something. You ain't putting your foot on it. You patty kicking with me. I said, put your foot on it. If Jesus ain't broke, you shouldn't be broke. If Jesus ain't depressed, you shouldn't be depressed. If Jesus is not broke down, you shouldn't be broke down. If Jesus is not on the cross, where my victorious people at? Where my victory people at? Where my folk that got to victory? Where my folk that's starting to act like my daddy? My daddy got stuff under his feet. My daddy got his foot on the devil's neck. My daddy got the power. Put some on somebody say, I'm acting like my daddy right now. I'm acting like my daddy right now. I got a little swagger right now. I got a little boldness to my step right now. I walk in because I got the victory right now. I'm acting like my daddy. Throw your shoulders back and say, I'm acting like my daddy. I dance like my daddy. I sing like my daddy. I praise like my daddy. Open your mouth and give God a praise because you got the victory. Find three folks and give them a fist bump and say, I got it. I got it. Sometimes you got to declare you got it, even if you don't feel it. 
even if you don't feel like it even if nobody else agrees with you I got this I got this I got this under control I got these bills under control I got this family in check I you ain't got it you ain't got it you ain't got it tell somebody else I got it See, the reason they don't believe you, sis, is because they're looking at what you got right now. They're looking at what you're driving right now. They're looking at what you're living in right now. They're looking at what you have right now. But I need somebody that sees through the eyes of faith and say, I already got it. I said, I already got it. I said, I already got victory. It's already in my house. Somebody lay hands on yourself and say, I'm already healed. I'm already here. Lay hands on your head. I'm already delivered. I'm already set free. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me help you. Let me help you. See, here's what you need to understand. That before something is true in the natural, it's got to be true in the spiritual. So when I say I already got it, don't look at what I have out here. I'm talking about what I got in here. If there anybody who received what God is saying in here, give God a praise if you got it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They still ain't got it. So let me help you. You know how it is when they drop off mail at your house and it's certified mail and they make you have to sign a signature and the signatures to let somebody know on the other end that I got what you said. God said for the blessings I've sent you, for the favor I've sent you, for the doors I've opened for you, for the opportunities I gave you, the only way I know you got it is when you open your mouth with the signature and give God a praise. If you got it, They got it over there. Let me work over here. If you got it over here. If you got it here in the middle. Let me see you wave your hand. If you got it in the middle. Let me see you clap your hands. If you got it over here. Let me see you jump on your feet. One, two, three. I got it. 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 I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm delivered. I'm delivered. I'm delivered. Set free. Set free. Set free. Everybody clap those. You got it. What you say, man? Let me see you wave your hand. They don't hear you in here. If you got it. What you say? Let me see your name for sure. They don't believe you in the back. Let me see you leave, but you're shy. I got it. 
Jesus. What you say? Somebody praise him in here. Your hands begin to worship right here. If your hands begin to worship right here, the Spirit of the Lord is in this house. The anointing of God is on this service. And perhaps there's somebody in this room right now that you know and you sense the touch of God on your life. He's been tapping you on your shoulder, saying, Enough is enough. You've been walking with chickens long enough. You've been living beneath your privileges long enough. You've been walking around here acting like a defeated child of the devil and you didn't even know that you were a victorious child of God. I want to touch and agree with you today that God will push you into your destiny. We're shaking off everything and everybody that's been trying to hold you back. In fact, I declare and I speak against every negative word that's been spoken to you or spoken about you. Some of you are living under a curse of people, but I break that curse today. I break what they said. I break what they spoke over you. And I declare the truth of God's word over your life that you shall be. I'm going to answer the call. I'm going to be who God called me to be. If that's you, lift your hands as a sign of surrender. I'm surrendering to the Holy Spirit right here. Right here! Yeah, if I were you and I weren't a Christian, I'd be rushing to this altar right now to give my life to Jesus. If you are backsliding here right now, I'll be rushing to this altar right now. If you're somebody that's been wrestling with the call from God and you're not sure if you should go or not, God has been calling you for a long time, but God has said you've been marked for greatness. You're not going to fit in anywhere. You might as well lean into this and accept this. Lift your hands right here. Lift your hands right here. I sense the anointing of God on you right here. Right here! I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. And I hear somebody say, well, we don't do that in our church. 
We don't do that. We don't do altar calls in my church. We do it right here in our seats. But I want somebody who's bold enough who will step outside of your norm and get in the aisle and come right down here and let that devil know you're not going to hold me back. And the same boldness that you take towards this altar, God said, I'm going to give you the boldness to walk into your blessing. I dare you, where are you at? Where are you at? The young people. I don't care who you are, man, woman, or child. God is calling you to another level of glory. And I want to see you right here. I want to touch and agree with you right here for God to do something amazing in your life. In fact, I want to deputize you. Yeah, because somebody being held back. Look over to your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. Is God talking to you? Is he talking to you? I'll go with you. There's one right there. Come on, talk to your neighbor. Don't talk to me. Talk to your neighbor and say, I'll go with you. I'll find you. Where are you, sis? Where are you, my brother? I know there's more in you than that. I know God's got greater things for you than that. You're living way below your privileges. You're better than that. You're higher than that. There's more in you than that. Shake off what you're used to and come up here. Where are you? You've been marked you by the master. Be with God He's got his mark on you. you You're not going to fit anywhere else but in his hand. There is in you. Not with your friends, not with your girlfriends, not with your homies. God has marked you. You're not going to fit anywhere. Be with God the safest place to be in the whole wide world is in the will of God. For somebody, you need to stop wrestling and come right now. Lift your hands, sister. Lift your hands right here. Lift your hands right here. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is upon you right now. The hand of God is upon you right now. I lay my hands on you. The glory of the Lord fall on you right now. Ah, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. It's happening right now. You've been marked. You've been marked. That's why you don't fit. That's why you don't fit. You ain't never going to fit. You ain't never going to fit. No, you ain't never going to fit. You're his. You're his. You're his. Somebody else needs to come. You're his. You're his. Yeah, all the things you're going through because you're his. <laughs> yeah, because you're his. Trouble can't stop you. The enemy can't stop you. You're his. Oh, I'm his. Somebody lift your hands and say, I'm his. I'm his. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I'm his. This is the day. We're breaking the yoke today. We're breaking the chain today. We're coming out of it today. Today, 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 today. Today, 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 today. He's calling you to pray. You'll let, you'll let God use you. If you're sitting around somebody and you see God ministering to them, just reach over and begin to pray for them right where you are. Just reach over. Don't make a commotion. Don't make a big deal. Just lay your hands on their shoulder. Just pray for them right there. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what kind of devils they're dealing with. You don't know what it took for them to come in here today, but they're here. They're here. Gonna be what God's called you to be. You will be what God has called you to be. I'm gonna do one last thing. I'm gonna do one last thing. If you're here and you're looking for a good church home, if you're looking for a place where they don't mind praising God with abandon, if you're looking for a place where you'll have a pastor or a preacher that will tell you the truth, the truth. If you're looking for a place where nobody's going to judge where you've been and who you've been with and what you did, and I just want to come in and grow in my walk with God, and you want to join the Impact Church, the doors of the Impact Church are open. You can come to my left and say, Pastor, I want to join your church. I want to get in on this. If you're in here, wherever you are, for some of you, you've been here a long time, but you need to make a recommitment. Here's one. Here's one. I knew you were in here. You need to make a recommitment. I see you're here, but I don't feel you here. 
You come in and spectate, look around and check out what's happening. Trying to figure out if it's new or if it's old. God has plans for you. God already knew what you were going to be going through when he called you. When he called you. The altar is being, they're being ministered to all around the altar. Miss Sharisha Bradley wants to become a member of the Impact Church. Come on, Impact Church. Make some noise for her. Come on, Impact Church. Come on, Impact Church. Come on, Impact Church. I can't hear you up in here. Come on, Impact Church. Make some noise. Is anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Miss Bradley, as a senior pastor of the Impact Church of Nashville, I want to extend to you the right hand of fellowship and officially welcome you as a member of this church and everything that comes with it. The privileges, the rights, the opportunities, the access to ministry and ministers to men and women of God who will pray with you. I want to officially give you the right hand of fellowship and say welcome to the Impact Church. Somebody give God praise. Somebody give God praise. This is another one. You want to join Impact Church too? What's your name? Brother Johnny, I want to extend to you as a senior pastor of this church, the right hand of fellowship, and let you know that you have the rights to all that this church has. Come grow with us. Come go with us. Get on this journey. Ain't nobody in here perfect. We're trying to make it. But I want to extend to you the right hand of fellowship and let you know that we will do you good. We'll pray with you. We'll fight for you. We'll fight beside you. And I want to officially give you the right hand of fellowship and welcome you to the Impact Church. Come on, church. Come on, Impact Church. Come on, Impact Church. They're still joining. They're still joining. Huh? Liam Moore, I was looking for you yesterday. You know I was. Yeah, but you're going to join our church today, right? Come on, let me give you the right hand of fellowship. Come on, saints. Come on, say she's just smiling and laughing. You want to give God praise in here. Lift your hands and give him glory in here. <laughs> Leah, I want to give you the right hand of fellowship. I want to welcome you to everything that this church is. I want to call out of you the gifts that God has in you. The talents, the pull you feel to ministry, that thing that makes you want to mime and serve God. I want to challenge you, don't let that fire go out. Don't let nothing around you let that fire go out. I'm laying my hands on you today, but I'm laying on everybody that looks like you. On every young person that's going to come in this church and that's going to look like you. You are the leaders of the new school. Receive this now. Ow! Somebody give God praise. Somebody give God praise. I don't need no spectators. I need some participators. Give God praise. Ow! Right there, right there, right there. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, right there. Somebody all rejoicing here. Somebody all rejoicing here. Somebody all rejoicing here. You to be. The Holy Ghost is moving all over this altar. They're being filled with the Holy Spirit. They're accepting the call of God's on their life. I'm going to close this service out. I'm over my time. But if you're online and you want to join, just go to our website and we'll receive your information and somebody will contact you to be a part of this great ministry and this great church. Would you praise God for our internet audience that's watching us right now? If you're interested in getting involved in the music and fine arts, listen, get with Miss Sarita. Come on, Sarita, you're going to close us out today. Get with Sarita McCoy. I know there's those of you that's out there that want to mime and you want to rap and you want to step. You can do more in the arts than just sing. We got room for everybody to do something. If you want to run around here with a flag, I'll take it. 
<laughs> you play instruments, you sitting back talking about, oh my God, they hit them keys right. Be quiet, get up here. Don't sit back and criticize us hitting notes and stuff wrong. Get up here yourself. Help us. Come on, praise God for this baby right here. This is how you're supposed to join a church. This is how you join a church. I'm glad. I'm glad about it. I'm happy about it. People dragging up here. We got to here. Come here, Lady Daphne. Come on, hug this baby. Miss Rita McCoy, would you give us the benediction today? God bless you. I'm done. From the worship to the sermon to the altar call and to the new members. Somebody give God a shout of praise. Oh, God desires us. Somebody give God a shout of praise. God gets the glory. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father God, for what you've done in this service. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And this week, Father God, you already God before us and made our way path clear, Father God. Everything, Father is going to be just like you, Father God. Everything is going to be more greatness, Father God. Everything is going to be more greatness. And it's greatness in you and greatness in us. And we believe that in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Come on. Oh, that wasn't loud enough. I said somebody shout Jesus. Y'all have a blessed week. Hallelujah. Glory to you.